Hello, dear Thomas. How are you doing? I'm really grateful that you have joined us today as a guest in my podcast. No, it's from a... somewhere mid of France, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm speaking to you from the middle of France. So, so no, it's an honor for me to be with you. And um, I've always have a, a soft spot for the Sufis of the world. I've known lots of different Sufis. So when you said you're helping run the Sufi Council in Pakistan, I couldn't but respond positively. Um, Thank you. I'm here. Yeah. First of all, in the beginning, I would love to know more about yourself by yourself. So give us a little introduction. Who Thomas is <laughs> and what he is doing. Gosh. Well, I'm, I was born in Montreal, so I'm a Canadian British scholar. I'm a philosopher and I've studied comparative global philosophy for many years. I have degrees from the University of London and a PhD in, in contemporary intellectual history. Hmm. I'm an intellectual historian specializing in religious conflict resolution. Hmm. So I, I was brought up in the, in the Cold War trying to stop the war between the Soviet Union and, and the capitalist world. It would have been what we call omnicide in hmm. philosophy circles. And it still would be. And so I was very active during the Cold War period in the 80s and 90s. I set up a group of philosophers for peace. We've held dialogues between intellectuals in the Americas, in, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, and so on. But then with the end of the Cold War in 1990, a lot of religious conflicts broke out in the Middle East, in Israel, Palestine, in the Balkans, at Kashmir, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Tibet, you name it, and Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was working for the University of London to set up a peace studies institute. That was mm -hmm. my job at the time, whilst I was doing a PhD at the same time. And <clears throat> so I, I set up a mediation service dealing with interfaith dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. It's the first and only one of its kind that deals with the spiritual dynamics of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. I was teaching at the University of London comparative religion um, and peace studies. And it seems to me all the religions promote peace. I've studied all the religions in depth. Hmm. I've had initiations into different religions. I've met their spiritual leaders and elders, hmm. uh, including Islamic um, and Sufi colleagues. I taught at the Muslim College in London. And I knew Dr. Saki Badawi, who was a very great man, a great scholar. Hmm. And I met lots of different Sufis over the years. And I know that we all want peace. Mm. So why isn't it happening? Why can't Pakistan, why can't Pakistan and India make a peace treaty? Why mm. can't Pakistan and Israel make a peace treaty tomorrow? Mm. So that's what I've been working on for the last, you know, since then. And uh, with varying success. Mm. Uh, the problem is human nature. It's a bit slow to respond. A bit like mm. the technology, you know, we have, we have a Zoom lag. <laughs> That's right. I'm also a poet, a novelist, and an all-round intellectual. Mm. You know, um, I believe in, in the beauty of wisdom. I love this world. I love people, human beings. Why can't we live in peace? Mm. It has to come from love. And so I've also written lots of, you know, poetry and musings. Mm. Okay, there we are. That's me in a nutshell. Let's start with a very basic question, which I wonder how to ask. And I always wonder how to digest the replies from different people. I usually talk about the word peace. What mm -hmm. is peace? How you describe the word peace? What is peace? The concept of peace? Mm -hmm. Like you started in 1991 and we are talking in 2021. Yeah, yeah. It's a long journey of 30 years now. Sure. And in 90s, the concept of peace was different than the concept of peace today. Is that are a the cha challenges I, to uh, are the challenges to peace were different than the challenges to peace? That's true. Today, yeah. yeah. So, how you describe the word peace, please? Right. Well, that's a very good question. That's that's the billion dollar question. Um, I mean, I'm a philosopher who specializes in linguistic philosophy. So whenever I'm asked a question like that, what is X or what is Y, I go to my uh, dictionaries and I, mm. I'm a great believer in comparative linguistics and etymology. Mm. 
So I've, I've written the first philosophical dictionary in all different languages. And it includes Arabic, Sanskrit, Hebrew, Greek, ancient Greek, Latin, Pali, Tibetan, Chinese, and so on. So in every one of those languages, the word for peace is slightly different. In Russian, it's yeah, in, uh, you know, in every language, it's different. And it has a different nuance of meaning in them all. Mm. Mm. And what I've done is I've studied the etymology of them. Mm. And I've taught courses on this question, just this one question you're asking, like that's a whole course um i would say to summarize having gone into it i mean the the gaelic word for peace is she s-i-d-a-g which is the irish word mm. and it means actually the supernatural realm of the fairy kingdoms or the the you know um like the uh, the jinn the elementals peace peace is a divine uh, presence i would say peace is the presence of the divine in our lives when we conform to the wisdom that that divine quality brings into being you know the absence of peace is when it's like a flower turning away from the sun mm. we get cold we live in perpetual darkness so i i would say to summarize you know very long like ma course worth of lectures peace is is the presence of that divine spirit in our lives um, and in Islam, the idea is that you, you know, you love it so much, you surrender to it. Um, and that is what enables peace to happen. It's like welcoming a good friend into your life, like a flower welcoming the sun every morning. Um, in Buddhism, they have a different concept. They say peace comes when you reach enlightenment, which is when you transcend ego, which mm -hmm. is mortal, um, her, uh, temporary aspect of the personality, you know, um, and you and I are talking way. We are we are here in bodies. We can talk, but that's temporary. Hundred years from now, you won't exist. I won't exist. But the spirit in us will continue, and so we have to get that spirit aligned to the absolute, and that is what brings authentic peace. Um, so, so peace is enlightenment through submission to the absolute in love hmm. uh, okay so that's my metaphysical description of peace from that there flows lots of ethical things like not harming other people following the ethical code because we're all aspects of divinity in in incarnation uh, it follows lots of political things like we should have a social system that looks after the elderly the poor the widows the unemployed you know we need a compassionate society um and we should have peace between nations. Hmm. We shouldn't, I mean, your nation is Pakistan, mine is what? Britain, Canada, France. I mean, we're just human beings on one small planet. So I don't want to bomb you, you shouldn't want to bomb me. And we shouldn't be empowering our military to hmm. steal our money. It should be going to help the poor, the unemployed, etc. cetera. That hmm. brings the, that's the ethics of peace in social hmm. application um, and political. Okay, so that's a little nutshell, you know, I could go into huge detail on all those points and and for instance gender relations and family family conflict is abysmal. I mean in parts of the world women are being oppressed and men too it's it's a dual thing in families, you know quarrels fights crimes of passion all that should should go we should love each other and live in peace. Okay. So can we say that there are three layers of peace one is. Uh, in, uh, individual, second is domestic, and third is international. So one is spiritual, second is social, which is domestic, mm. and the third is international layer. So it is more political. Well, we could we can carve the cake up differently, and we can play with numbers. I mean, I'm writing a book on religious mathematics at the moment, mm. and I'm I'm looking at how spirituality and ethics can be put into mathematics. So that is of mm. great interest to me. Um, mm. I, I, would, I would agree that there's a sort of a gradation or emanation from the, the monad, which is peace. Mm. You know, and when you get to heaven and we, we're in the presence of Allah, or whatever you want to call that absolute, there will be peace. Mm. And yet when we're here on earth, having our troubles and difficulties and anxieties, I mean, 
especially now in a time of pandemic and COVID, and nobody quite knows where it's come from. You know, people are in angst. We're all in turmoil here. Mm -hmm. So my job as a philosopher is how can we, how can we increase the vibrations of peace here on this plane? Um, you know, it's going to be fine in the heaven world. So we know that. <laughs> it's just this world is in tor torment and turmoil. Um, so that's kind of what I've been focusing on. Yeah, that's true. But I'll, I'll come again to my uh, question. When we see that, uh, when we talk about the internal peace, it is someone's individual domain. So it's all about one uh, person and his or her internal, spiritual, metaphysical kind of experiences to reach the peace. And one can define uh, one cannot be able to perhaps define the status of peace. It is more like a flavor to taste. It is not visible, but it is tasteable. And when we come on um, the social peace structure, which is more uh, domestic, like relations within the family, within neighborhood, in the society, in community, that's an other layer of peace or uh, that is more a social peace. And when it comes on uh, the international level or the political level, where nations involve in the process of peace and they define what is peace for them. So it changes all, all the sudden, right? Hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, your analysis is, is, is the beginning of a, a way of looking at these things. I mean, some of the great peace thinkers of our time, like Johann Galton and others, have looked at peace sociologically. Hmm. I mean, obviously, social systems and, and have conflicts in, implicit between their different classes and social groups and hmm. different, you know, professional classes and so on. I think one of the problems about peace is the, is the question of power the end of the day it's who's got the power who's holding the gun look mm. look at what's going on in burma at the moment or myanmar i mean the mm. poor protesters they wanted they thought they'd have voted and got you know a certain election mm. and now it's been cancelled and the army's taken over and is shooting innocent people in the streets i mean so peace and the army thinks the military think that's peace it's suppressing mm. stupid rebels okay they might have to kill a few but it'll bring mm. people back to Burma, um, whereas the rebels think, well, hang on, they've stolen our democracy. So there's a power struggle going on. And that's what Hobbes, Hobbes talked about this, the political philosophy. And Plato talked about power. Aristotle talked about power. You know, in Islamic history, the problem, I mean, even in Islam, supposed to bring peace within like a few decades, mm. the Shias and Sunnis have each other's the battle. Aisha and Ali are fighting wars, you know, like, where's the peace? It's all about power. We haven't yet learned how to deal with the fact that we humans are powerful creatures. How do we use that properly and wisely? You know? mm. and, and that goes back to the spiritual journey. We have to conquer that ego. I mean, yeah. Buddha was a very powerful man. He was a prince, Siddhartha, mm. could have been king, you know, but he voluntarily gave that up mm. and went off to conquer himself. The greatest power is self-conquering. Mm. And that's what Muhammad knew when he said the greatest jihad is, is against ignorance and evil within myself. Mm. Um, you know, that's what we have to conquer. Mm. So, um, yeah. Will, uh, Thomas, tell me, uh, do you think that religion is something which is a driving force to achieve peace or it is the most devastating thing which disturbed the whole phenomenon of peace how, how you see the role of religion uh, towards yeah. peace it's a good question um, well I think it's like water religion and the water they're the same so in the right dosage it keeps us alive without water my body will not survive more than hmm seconds because i made 60 percent of water hmm. and i need to drink regularly blah blah um but too much of it it will hmm. cause a flood and i'll drown and it'll devastate the town and we'll all die so hmm. it's, it's regulating them 
now. We need religion or, I mean, the word religion, again, let me quote you etymology here. Most people don't know, it's a Latin term. Okay. Religio, and, and it was coined in the early days of the ancient Roman society. Mm -hmm. The greatest early king of Rome was called Numa Pompilius, and he devised Roman religion. And he explained all the rites, rituals, feast days, what the priests and priestesses should do to honor the gods. Mm. And religio meant doing something with total punctuality, precision, piety, and devotion. In mm. Latin, you can hoe your garden religiously. You can um, make a dress religiously. You can have a radio interview religiously as long as we do it absolutely with precision to the best of our capability. It was only later that this, this, this adjective uh, became abstracted as a noun. Really, the word religion means perfection in action, okay. inspired by divine piety. Okay. So, you know, I'm all for that. I think we should go back to the original definition. What is perfection in action? It's become a sort of, you know, a mascot for my team to bash your team. That's mm. not religion. Nima Pompilius would be horrified at the way they misused his work. Mm. So that's my first, I have to say that before I can explain, you know, how do we get the regulation of religion, i.e. water, mm. everyone that needs it? That's, you know, that's the struggle we're in here. Um, mm. So Thomas Aquinas, I don't know if you, you probably have studied a little bit of Catholic Christian mm -hmm. theology. Thomas Aquinas is one of the greatest intellectuals of the West here in France. Mm -hmm. right. He said when he was got his doctorate at the University of Paris, mm -hmm. in those days the custom was he gave a sermon. And he and his sermon has survived. It was written down. It's amazing. He said, Thank you so much for my doctorate. It's a great honor to be here. I take the duty of teaching very seriously. And for me, a scholar is like someone higher up the mountain that receives the divine rain from God mm -hmm. because they're closer to it. And then they have the duty to send it down the mountain in rivers to all the people that are in the, in the valleys dying of thirst. So he used the water metaphor, right? And, um, and I think it's a good metaphor. That's why I've used it. The problem we have is that the religious thinkers on the planet, be they Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, they're not collaborating enough on designing like common waterways to get this water out. They're too often in competition. So you have Christians saying all Muslims are evil, Muslims saying all Christians are evil, Muslims saying all Jews are evil and vice versa. You know, you have these wars going on. And and meanwhile, people are starving, you know, without the water. And that's why I like the Sufis, it's why I like the Kabbalists, it's why I like the mystics in all the religions, the enlightened ones, because they are the people trying to build the, uh, like the irrigation system, mm. the entire community. You know, we have to get these religions working together, delivering the goods of, of enlightenment. And then we'll get peace. And that, that peace will be the political peace or the domestic peace. Eventually it will be the political peace. But at first it has to start as a gnosis. It has to start as a transformation of the soul, I believe. I mean, I work from the inside out, right? Hmm. We tried going from the outside in. That was Lenin's view and that was Stalin's view. And hmm. man, we just seize power and then everyone will be peaceful. It doesn't work. Millions have died. We, Dr. Thomas, I, I, I would love to put an example here. Uh, we were just talking about Myanmar, right? Yes. And a few years back, if we go and see the situation in Myanmar, the people who are, by the way, there's a claim and there are uh, scholars like you, they, uh, they always claim that Buddhism is the most spiritual religion. Mm. They, they always uh, go for this internal peace and especially uh, the religious hierarchy uh, in them is more inclined towards that meditation, that 
all the spiritual practices which can the Rohingyas and it gave Buddhism a terrible name. Yeah. So it, it was a question mark if you reach on internal peace, but still on domestic or international level, where the social peace comes or where the political peace comes, you can be a different person in your actions. While you have the internal peace as you see it. Well, I mean, that, that business of the Buddhists in Burma and, and also Sri Lanka, because they went yeah. lethally for the Tamils, Hindus. Um, I was disappointed, I'll be honest, at the level, the quality of Buddhist gnosis going on in those groups. Hmm. The problem is that, and this is a sociological function of human beings in groups, nations, ethnicities, tribes, they have this group mentality, which has yeah. been studied by scholars. And you can call yourself whatever, you know, X or Y as a religion. Hmm. If you get a big crowd and you feed them, pump them propaganda, they'll do anything. I mean, hmm. I've seen this in Britain, which used to be quite a rational, conservative with a small C, but liberal with a big L kind of country where people were very tolerant. And suddenly hmm. Brexit was created out of nowhere, like a sort of fantasy uh, war hmm. game by people like Steve Bannon, manipulating through social media people's public opinion. And we've been turned into a, a nation of complete europhobes which mm. is like, ridiculous it's as if um suddenly the north of pakistan was going to declare war on the south of pakistan you know? mm. Mm. so i think I, I don't underestimate the capacity of human beings to behave stupidly mm. that was mm. foolish <laughs> that's yeah, the they have, hell of capacity. They he, have the hell of capacity for that yeah sadly we're you know that's why we need teachers still <laughs> I mean, that's right. you know, so, um, but I don't give up the faith. I'm, I'm still, I still believe in the purity of the teachings and I don't care which lineage you're coming at this from. I, yeah. I've studied, I've, I've actually gone into the nature of enlightenment itself in quite a lot of detail. Mm. I've studied enlightenments, plural. Mm. I argue with the philosopher of religions that we ought to be talking about enlightenments. Mm. If a Muslim reaches enlightenment, what is it? like you know if a mm. buddhist does or a hindu or a christian or a jew mm. and i looked at it linguistically and it's slightly different in each one um which is interesting you know what about a chinese mm. Taoist or something or even a marxist or a secular person can they reach enlightenment and what's their enlightenment like um, so i've looked at this comparatively and, and yes i think they're all we can create a harmony of enlightenments and mm. we should each other's you know i've worked with native mm. american indian elders american indians can reach enlightenment they don't have mm. to be a buddhist or a muslim or christian if they stick to their teachings of great spirit yeah. they have enough wisdom in their lineage mm. it's just it's just clearing the paths my job as a mm. scholar is to clear the paths so people can walk them. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yes that's true that's true okay uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, tell me, uh, you started working for peace and uh, you have a philosophical background in 1991, if I'm not wrong, right? Well, actually, no, it was before that. <laughs> before that, okay. So you, uh, we, we can rightly say that you started the activism for peace when the Cold War is there, in the era of Cold War. In the mid-80s. I launched Philosophy mm -hmm. and Historians of Peace in the mid-80s in London. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we thought the world was going to be blown up by nuclear weapons. And you have seen uh, Russians defeat in Afghanistan, and then there is a chaos for years in Afghanistan, and everyone was engaged in Middle East while handling uh, Sad uh, the threat of Saddam Hussein. And then suddenly, there was a new phenomenon raised uh, Muslim terrorism. Mm. So, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, mm. Al-Zawari, Islamic threat to West, Islamic threat to open society, Islamic threat to Western culture. And then we, we all witnessed the unfortunate 9-11. Uh, mm. And that changed the whole world in a night. 
after 20 years of continuous war against terrorism now we are watching that there is no more war against terrorism now the world is shifting from terrorism to anti china political and war strategies mm. so is peace a product to sell in different packages and how politicians use the word and how the greater nations use the word to have their vested interest to secure their vested interest Gosh, well, look, that was a brilliant little five minute summary of recent history. And, and there were a million questions in all that. I mean, whether you articulated them or not, they're latent. Let me just walk through some of my responses to that because um, you're right, that in the early 80s, the mid 80s, there was turmoil in Afghanistan. I was one of the people in London marching for peace in Afghanistan. I was supporting peace in Europe, anti-nuclear weapons in Europe, but also a peace a settlement in Afghanistan. And, um, um, you know, that's always been my position. I love Afghan culture. I have many Afghan friends. I've not yet been there in this life, but um, it's one of my most beloved countries, right? Hmm. And yet, so to me, it was absolutely abhorrent that it should be in this term hmm. of the great game. Hmm. Russia made a terrible strategic mistake in invading um, and as we all know, it was Jimmy Carter and, and Brzezinski tripped them into invading, deliberately. Right. The CIA set up a trap for them. Hmm. And the Russians stupidly walked into it like a big bear, you know, drunk on vodka. Um, and it took them ages to get out. Finally, Gorbachev got them out in, I think it was 91. He, he you know, he pulled all the troops out. And we were really happy at that. Like, thank God, you know, that, that episode was a stupid thing. Um, but then uh, warlords started fighting among themselves. Who was gonna, who was gonna reach supremacy? Um, and, you know, I, I, I was teaching at the Muslim college by then. And I actually had set up my mediation service for religious conflict resolution, right? It's a bit like, you know, um, and, and the conflict in Afghanistan wasn't going away. And one of my students who was an Afghan came to me and said, look, we've got to try and do something about this. This was when ah Ahmed Shah Massoud was still alive, fighting for the Northern Alliance against the Taliban who were trying to sort of take over. And, you know, mm. at first we thought the Taliban, well, that's all right. They're students. That's a good idea. You know, let's, let's get the students making peace. But before we knew it, they were fighting with other kinds of Muslims. And it was obvious they had a certain view of Islam that was quite, Mm, let's say narrower than mm. mainstream Afghans. Or more political. Okay. Well, I'd say, I'd say also probably narrower because theologically, yeah, yeah. I'd say that these people haven't got the depth. You see, the, the Afghans I knew, I mean, I met the head of the Afghan Sufi community, who was a friend of mine, mm. the head of the theory order, um, uh, Syed Ghailani. Now, he was a profound thinker. These, these mm. kind of Sufis were like seriously deep, rich Sufis going all the way direct to Muhammad with, mm -hmm. uh, with the breadth of wisdom there. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't want war, you know. Mm -hmm. They wanted Afghanistan to go back to being the Switzerland of, of Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And the Afghan royal family always highly cultured. They, they spoke French, they, they spoke German. They were, you know, they were multilingual. They loved India. Um, mm -hmm want more with anyone they wanted afghanistan as a neutral country like switzerland mm. and that's what i would like um but of course we went to the afghan embassy in london i met the brother of ahmed shah Massoud, who was the ambassador in london and we we said why can't we mediate here like we offered mm. can't we just get these different representatives of different types of islam in in one put them in a hotel in geneva and get them to sign a peace treaty because none of us have a monopoly on the nature of God. Mm. God is so vast. If you take literally the idea of God is great, Allah Akbar, mm. God is so vast. How can any one of us know the totality of that or have a monopoly? Mm. If we start from that position of humility, 
Hmm. And then peace inevitably flows, right? But anyway, to cut a long story short, I was told, well, yeah, we'd love to do that. I even went to the Iranian embassy and, and got an agreement and got a discussion with them. They said, no, we're signed up. We want to help peace in Afghanistan. Hmm. The trouble, they said, is you've got to go to the American embassy uh, because they're making noises about pipelines and oil, and they're sort of stirring the pot here in the Middle East and in Central Asia. Um, and I said, what, America? What? You know, my friends overseas, I, I knew America very well. I've traveled all over the States, you know. Um, and, and then um, the chaos of 9-11 happened. Now, I was really annoyed at 9-11, really extremely annoyed, because it was like the destruction of everything I'd been working for, interfaith harmony, peace in the Middle East, reconciliation of different forms of Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Suddenly, mm. it was all like, you know, it was an act of, of sheer quintessential ignorance, right? Mm. And actually, strange to say, I was with a dear friend of mine, a Sufi, actually, who was a student of Idris Shah, if you know about Idris Shah's work. Yeah. And we, we watched the television. Mm. We'd been on a walk on the Long Mind in Shropshire and could not believe our eyes, right? Now, for the first few months, I believed the official narrative. Oh, bin Laden did it. Oh, Al Qaeda. But I did say to my American friends, I said, it's a bit funny that was announced on day three. Like, how do they know that? You know, how have they found a passport in the rubble? You know, I asked some searching questions. In November, I organized a conference as an educator on the educational implications of 9 11. I had Jane Goodall come. Uh, talking about aggression and chimpanzees. I had scientists, social scientists and stuff. And I did that at Gladstone's old house in Wales, Horden. It's now a library for divine miracles. So I thought that was a good place. Mm. And I, I've always liked Gladstone. He was a clever prime minister and a liberal. But so I, for the first couple of years, I was teaching in schools, religious studies program. I accepted the official narrative. <clears throat> But the more I went into it, and I had friends from the States who said, Thomas, something happened on 9-11 that is not what we're being told. And I did my sums, I did my mathematics. And as a historian, you see, I was taught to do forensic detailed historical studies at the university. Mm. And my thesis finishes at 9-11. It was examined, you know, I stopped there, it was from, 1945 to 2001, the search for peace in the world among intellectuals. After that thesis was, you know, finished, I thought, well, what am I going to do next? And I spent two years in detail researching what happened on 9-11. As a historian, I looked at all the evidence, all the literature, all the books, all the history, and all I can say is that we, as a historian, we don't know what happened. We don't mm -hmm. actually know who did it. There is very strong evidence that the Bush Commission inquiry was unfactual, unsupported, and insufficient explanatory. The book is also a philosophical study about the nature of history. You see, history works with hypotheses and proof. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I say it's a fact that Gandhi helped bring Indian independence, you know, well, is it a fact? We can go and look at documents, we can look at newsreels, we can look at people that met him, we can look in the newspapers, and we can build up a, yes, it's a fact that, and he did that, and therefore it's important. Um, we can have different interpretations of, you know, what he did and why and how, how important he was, but we can agree about certain things. When it comes to 9-11, historians do not agree about anything. They don't agree about who was on the planes. You know, they don't agree about the, uh, the technical business of how the buildings collapsed. And I've sat at the feet and listened to the architects and engineers telling me that those buildings are not brought down by planes alone. So they were brought down clearly by something in, internally pre-wired. And I've, I have to accept that from my, my professional colleagues. There's a chap at the University of Alaska who's just published a big report on Building 7, which was a huge building, 
which collapsed into its own footprint at, in seven seconds. And it wasn't hit by a plane and it had no fires in it to speak of. Okay. It's an internal demolition. So the, I start with that as the hypothesis as a historian. And I ask the question, well, who would have wanted to wire those buildings and make it look like Al Qaeda did it? Who would have benefited from that? Mm. And I explore the hypotheses. It's a, it's a thousand pages, two volumes. And I, do, I, I say at the end, we don't know enough to know the answer to that question. But I'm the first historian and the first philosopher to actually pose the question, which I'm astounded by. I mean, you know, I don't know who the greatest historians are in Pakistan right now, but please put me in touch. <laughs> I'd love to, you know, talk with them. Okay, so that's that. The other thing I just want to say in, in, in you know, it's such a big topic and very dear to my heart. Um, I see the problems of the Middle East as a, as a joined up thing, collective. Um, Israel, Palestine, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kashmir, you know, it's all sort of one interconnected thing that I would like to do my best as a doctor to heal. Yeah. Like Ibn Shina, you know, he used to wander about trying to heal people. Mm. I'm, I'm a modern day equivalent, right? Mm. And I'm really, yeah, I love the Middle East. I just want it to live in peace. So I set up this thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the Middle East. Uh, in 2008, I went to Israel and Palestine. I interviewed, I talked to the Sufi Sheikh of, of Israel, Palestine, um, who lives up near, you know, in the north of Israel. And I had interviews with Kabbalists, with, with Christian mm -hmm. bishops and Christian people. And that work is continuing. So I'm the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the Middle East. Mm -hmm. To me, it's really important that the Sufis of the region should collaborate mm -hmm. and, and work with their colleagues in the other religions to get a dialogue going. That's why I've responded positively to your request to talk. Because what you're doing is very important. And I you know, take my hat off to you. Um, because I know enough about the history of Pakistan and its intellectual history, the great philosophers that you've produced, to know that you also, as culture, want peace. Um, and um, I'll do anything I can to help. OK, that's, that's, I hope that's a bit of a response to your comment. Yeah. So I, I was not complaining. I was just curious to ask it. And now, Dr. Thomas, on the ending notes, uh, I would, I would, as as an optimistic person, I I'm very uh, concerned about the situation in Middle East. And you rightly said that every person who is peace loving always keen about the peace in Middle East because many of the problems comes from Middle East. Uh, so the present peace accord, the Abrahamic peace accord, which is uh, which has taken place among Israel and the Arab countries, four Arab countries, and we are uh, hoping to for its extension in more countries. How you see it? It uh, will bring the value in uh, the peace process in the region. Uh, what are the challenges to keep it sustainable? And what are the hopes in the future from this peace process? Okay, so thank you. Um, right, so <clears throat> let me just go back a little bit to answer your question, to talk about the Trump Netanyahu proposal for peace between Israel and Palestine. Um, <laughs> as you recall, a few months before he lost office, Trump mm. White House announced this thing with Netanyahu there and a bunch of others. And it was the first sincere and overall attempt to solve this problem of Israel-Palestine. Now, I did something unusual. Most commentators, peace thinkers, threw, threw it in the bin. They said, no, mm. useless, we don't want it. I think the chairman of the Arab League actually on television dropped it in the waste paper basket right, as a sort of gesture. I said, as a scholar of peace, that no, that's not very polite. You know, at least they tried. So I went through it with a fine tooth comb and I wrote a hundred page commentary on it, right? 
and I, I found things that were good about it. I, I, it's like examining some work. I was marking their homework, right? Mm. And I said, this is great, that's great, this is terrible, that's ridiculous, right? went through it. What was good about it was that it was suggesting that Palestine have a railway connecting Gaza and, and the West Bank, make a functioning state. It was good because it wanted an airport near East Jerusalem that could be used by the Muslim community on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, visiting the Muslim sites. Because don't forget, Jerusalem is the second, well, third holiest city in Islam. Um, and it was good because, I couldn't believe it, I read in the text, it says, all religious pilgrims will be granted unfettered access to all of Israel and all of Palestine, 24-7. Hmm. Right? Well, like, what's not to like about that? Okay. Yeah. The first peace agreement that actually made those bold statements of interference. Mm. Okay. So I marked those very high, said, great, A star. The fact that they didn't invite the Palestinians to join the discussions, well, that was a C minus. That was rude, right? The fact that um, they make all the people in Gaza put down all their guns, everyone has to like go hands up, no more rockets, nothing, nothing, with no agreement. And of course, Israel keeps military superpower status. So, you know, there's like there were problems with the treaty, which I explained in detail. Now, my view is that that document should be rescued by Biden and by everyone else involved mm. and upgrade it, take out all the stupidity, but keep the fundamentals. What we have to get is an Israel-Palestine peace, and we have to get Palestine recognized as a viable international state in law, you know, and, and all this shilly-shallying about will we, won't we, you know, blah, blah, has to end. They have to have status. The other good thing in the document was that long-term they get a port off Gaza so they can, uh, you know, trade like a normal country, sell their olives and whatever. And also, uh, in the meantime, they can use somebody else's port and they were named like for official Palestinian trade routes. And also they get a huge economic boost to the region. So my view is that we should A, revitalize and reactivate that peace treaty. It's the only good thing that Trump actually did. Well, one of the very few is actually put that on the table uh, because he's naive enough to have done it, let's say. As for the, what Israel has been doing is trying to make peace with specific Arab nations, right? Um, and calling it the Abrahamic Initiative. My concern about that is that it looks to me very much as if it's trying to make peace with selected Sunni nations and ignoring and, and trying to create a sort of alliance against Iran and the Shia nations. You see, Israel has this phobia about Shiism, about Iran, but also Shias anywhere in, in, in Syria or Iraq, mm. or wherever, right? Now, what I want, as chair of the Truth and Reconciliation for the Middle East, hmm. I want a comprehensive universal peace treaty hmm. with all religions and all nations in the Middle East. And that has to include the Shias. You can't hmm. exclude them. Hmm. I know enough about the intellectual and philosophical history of Shiism to know that it's at least as profound as that hmm. of Sunni. You know, Ali was a genius and his descendants and yep. the arms they are they were geniuses you know yeah and therefore that voice cannot be bombed into silence yeah that is, that is that is to me the great mistake of american and israeli foreign policy ever mm. since ever since the coup against the shah actually i think mm. the american kissinger types who, who plot foreign policy have got an axiomatic error going on, which is we will never ever make peace with Iran as long as it's a Muslim state. Mm. You know, that's an axiom of their view of the world, which I think is false and flawed. And it's also in among Israeli foreign policy experts. I've been calling for a Shia Sunni peace commission. Mm. I would like to set up the highest levels among theologians, doctors of, you know, the sacred texts, at the very highest levels between uh, Shias and Sunnis to work out a peace commission, a treaty, mm. a peace pact. Mm. Sufis would have to sit on that as well. And the mm. different 
minds like the Ishmaelis and others. Mm. Because to me, if Muhammad was around or Ali or any of the great inspirers, you know, yeah. or whoever, they'd be appalled to see Muslims fighting Muslims over, mm. you know, legacy yeah. and stuff. Um, so that's that's my position on the the Abrahamic treaty thing has to extend. I will only mm. take it seriously if it extends and includes Iran. Mm. We stop this demonization of Iran because it's a Shia nation. That's just like a fundamental ignorance, mm. uh, like is a roadblock to the holistic universal peace in the Middle East that I want, mm. which I believe is in the interests of Europe. By the way, mm. the European Union. And Europe wants a genuine peace in the Middle East. We want a genuine Palestinian autonomous state living in harmony and nonviolence with Israel. We want to secure Israel living in peace, but we and we want you know an Iran that's living in peace and Iraq. You know my view to finish is that I mean I was tasked at the University of London to create a peace institute, mm. and Senate House during World War II. Senate House was the Ministry of Intelligence of the British War effort. Right. Hmm. Of information, they called it. I'm saying we need to win the peace now <laughs> with as much dedication and discipline and specialized knowledge as, as you know, we win wars. Now those brains should be focused on winning peace. And that has to be inclusive and universalistic, not our team wins by beating your team. That's old fashioned thinking that's got to go. I agree. I agree. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for uh, uh, this podcast and your time. And I am thinking that uh, this podcast is, we are ending this podcast with many unfinished topics. So we should sit again, we should talk again, and we will be having, we will be happy to have a opportunity of learning uh, by you. and to bring a thing on record and uh, make things correct on record i will just want to bring one point that israel is uh, against iran yes the iranophobia is there but there is no sh- anti shia kind of uh, movement in the uh, israeli foreign policy because they are very close strategic allies with azerbaijan which is again a shia nation <laughs> so the the israel and azerbaijan bond is uh, very strong and they are strategic allies and now in the war against armenia <laughs> israel stood with azerbaijan and uh, so yes uh, that's again a political arena and we can discuss the possibilities and the situations and the moves political moves of the foreign policy of different countries but for now i guess um, it's time to end the conversation for today and hope to see you soon and i'm sure uh, we will be having a new a new session next session in few days okay well uh, pleased to meet you and thank you so much for inviting me